G'day everyone and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max and today I'm joined by Flynn. So let's get right into it. A couple of weeks ago, there was a massive, massive uh, flaw within Linux. Linux is obviously one of the biggest distributions in the world. Uh, basically the XZ backdoor. What happened with this is that somebody behind the scenes was repeatedly uploading updates to the unstable version of Linux. Uh, and this was going under the radar. Of course, it was the unstable version, so it wasn't as widespread, thankfully. Yep. Uh, what happened was someone eventually found out something was going wrong here. And this was a massive news in cybersecurity. But what me and Max wanted to talk about today particularly was there's a lot of sort of consensus in the community right now that this highlights how brilliant open source is, which I don't think is actually entirely correct. I think it highlights both uh, sides of why open source is good and why open source sometimes isn't as good. On the bright side, this vulnerability only got discovered because it was open source. Somebody went uh, went out of their way to realize something was wrong here. Someone's putting a backdoor into the unstable version and that's how it was discovered. Right. But on the flip side, because this is an open repository and anyone can uh, you know, socially engineer their way and upload code repository uh, repeatedly, or you know, do push requests yeah. to the um, to the version. That's how it got in there yeah, originally. Exactly. Yeah. So, yes, this was a great example into this was discovered because it was open source. But we also have to think that it was partially the partially the reason why this happened in the first place, place because it was open source itself. What was the what was the distribution? I was the unstable versions of Linux. So, it, yeah, basically it was on all installations of Linux and other Unix-like operating systems. Right. Oh, so it was like a, a util like package or something. Yeah, bundled, basically. Bundled with the, the um, OS. Yeah. So basically yeah. how it works is that these were on the unstable versions, which don't have as much scrutiny before they go right. um, into the, I suppose, more tested full versions. Mm. So I guess it would be like the like SDKs that come with Windows in a sense. Uh, I believe so. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think so. Maybe we'll just double check that. But anyway, yeah. I, honestly, in my opinion, I think it they sort of cancel each other out. Yeah. You know, it's you know, it's great to say, oh yeah, look, we found this vulnerability because of you know open source. We're able to dig through the code, but also exactly like you said, how did the vulnerability get there? Yeah. Because it's open source. Yeah. So XZ utils basically. It does data compression. Okay. Uh, it makes it so that data isn't lost when they're doing data compression on Unix systems. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, well, for starters, luckily it was found now. Imagine this uh, went on to the stable version. That would have been absolutely devastating. Yeah. Um, I believe it was, yeah, it was a Microsoft developer that found it, uh, ironically. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think that we've said it before, but a lot of people like to think that open source is the answer to everything, mm. which I think open source is a fantastic tool and some things just make sense to be open source, like yeah. WordPress, imagine if WordPress was yeah, closed yeah, source, yeah. be a pain in the ass. Yeah. Um, but open source for things like that, it just makes sense. But open source isn't a solution to everything. No. It does introduce risk uh, to a sense. Maybe that risk is mitigated. Something I would ask the audience as well is that a lot of people like to say oh you know well open source people go through and they find bugs and then they um submit them have you ever gone through uh, yeah. a fed a bug and submitted it yeah. i could tell you i've submitted bugs when i'm like just on a website and it doesn't work I'm like hey this doesn't work but i've never gone through a code repository yeah. and found a bug and submitted it to people it's the same thing as like when you're doing some coding or you're looking through do you in your spare time go through stack overflow and answer questions no i personally don't i know people that do really but um i'm not like i know a couple people personally okay. but i know that people generally do do it but you've also got a way i personally think the incentive to yeah. be malicious and do this is higher the a lot of being time. constructive yeah yeah the, you do hope that the people that are the using it for good is more widespread yeah but there's no way that we could possibly measure that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I just wanted to highlight how I don't think that 
open source is the sunshine and rainbows that a lot of people make it out to be. It's a great solution for a lot of different things, but it's it's not the be all end all. No, no, no. Yeah, look, I like open source. I think that open source is fantastic in the way that you're able to, you know, really customize the the stuff that you or maybe tailor is a better word, tailor different softwares to your own solution. Uh, I think that's really useful. I think, like I said, it is risky. It all kind of depends on what it's being used for and how many people it's going to and, you know, what's the purpose of the software. It all comes down to that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's good, but it's also bad. Yeah, it's one of those those ones where it's sort of in between. I think it's just a, yeah, it's a case by case basis. Yeah. Uh, the the only thing that kind of bugged me about it is that people do take this approach that it's God's gift to the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's that's not right. And it's, you know, I I know a couple people who think that you know open source is you know should be used everywhere and should be used for everything. But yeah, I kind of agree disagree with that. Yeah, I think if I had to say. I would think majority of applications or a lot of them would benefit from using open source, right. but it's definitely not every application. There's certain things that inherently just should not be open source. I yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. So moving on with this is a topic that we, um, we've kind of had in the back burner for a little bit. We, we thought we'd, you know, kind of bring it out a little bit, uh, cybersecurity burnout. Now, I'm not experiencing any burnout uh, personally. Flynn, are you experiencing any burnout? Uh, not particularly. I think cybersecurity for me is such a... When I get a bit burnt out in a certain thing, I can easily move on to other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, nice that's pivot. kind of a good thing with cybersecurity. Yeah. But it is a bit of a, I suppose, like epidemic in a way, mm. especially with SISOs. Yeah. Um, SISO burnout is such a widespread issue not just in Australia, in uh, on a global scale. Well, I suppose we wanted to talk about why is that actually the case. Yeah. So I think the main uh, reason I find a lot of the time is under-resourcing. Mm. And unfortunately, uh, I think we've gotten a lot better in the last five years or so, but I do think that a lot of SISOs still feel like a sort of scapegoat role. Yeah. Where... Sizers, a lot of the time, they're supposed to... You, how a sizer should work is that you have influence on the board. You talk to the board directly. Yep. You shouldn't be... I don't like when I see sizers that talk through a CFO or sometimes even lower than a CFO. It's through someone than a CFO, then a CFO talks to the board. I think that kind of defeats the purpose a lot of the time of a sizer. Yep. Sizers should talk directly to the leaders of a company or the board. And this was in like a um, like an ASIC report or... A- uh, app or report, uh, it? It's something that comes up all the time where it's just always like, oh, sizos are leaving their roles. Um, but it, it's something that is getting addressed. CPS 224 actually does have the requirement that, uh, you know, boards are on board. Mm. Boards are on board. Boards are on board. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's also, you know, cybersecurity, it is a demanding field by nature. Yeah. Um, the nature of, you know, attackers are always attacking your infrastructure. Um, you know, you're always having to sort of communicate with non-technical people and to explain the importance and trying to get resourcing for that because a lot of times it's not obvious what the benefit of investing in security is. Yeah, and I think that's a lot of the, the trick with cybersecurity is it can be hard because realistically, yeah, cybersecurity isn't an income-based uh, field. It's It's all, you know, preventative. It's all protecting your assets. And it's hard sometimes to give like a deliverable and and show exactly what uh something does that you've been implementing yeah it, it, sometimes it's quite difficult to present that in a way that just uh gives off like a point of uh like a confident sort of um push for you know why it's being done sometimes yeah. that's difficult to to get across to people who don't work in cybersecurity. um i think it's an incredibly stressful role being a CISO. um i think that you know there, there's so much stress from exactly like you said, potentially being a scapegoat, having under resourcing, having uh, you know issues when there's um, there's developers that uh, don't want to like. I guess if there's a big you know rally against a certain cybersecurity measure, that makes it difficult to um, to to get around that. Exactly like when we were talking about the union for um 
before there was this uh like construction company that was trying to um have a a new uh system put in and it involved like ipads so in sort of this scenario they you know went to the union and complained because moving to this new system kind of um really it didn't work for them in cybersecurity, say you put in MFA or some conditional access that makes it a tiny bit more difficult to beat for people. Uh, a challenge might be that they might, you know, really go against you and, you know, have some resentment is not the right word, but have some, uh, I don't know, a little bit less reluctance. Let's yeah, be more reluctant to yeah. talk to you about things. And, you know, I think a lot of the time, most of that stress will land on someone in a CISO position and, there's also, you know, regulations and, you know, re- really it sometimes feels like, you you know, you, there could be, a CISO could be a role for two people, right? Yeah. yeah. And it feels like it's just a infinite cat and mouse game. You, you're always trying to catch up. Yeah. Um, you never can really get ahead of the curve. No. Uh, I think another kind of point to it is that I feel like there's not really a perfect CISO in the sense of, because of the nature of cybersecurity that, you know, you can have the more technical people, but once you're in a CISO role, uh, by the way, are we calling it CISO or CISO? What is the actual correct pronunciation? So, to be honest, I was going to wait till we had a CISO guest, and then, uh, <laughs> then that would be the first thing I right. asked them. Well, well, let us know uh, in the comments, CISO or CISO. I personally always say CISO. I say um, CISO. <laughs> oh, there you go. We're, we're at a difference there. But um, yeah, so obviously when you're in a CISO role, you you got to deal with people. Yeah, it's the nature of it. And you know, if you're coming up from a technical background, sometimes that can be a bit more difficult. On the uh, on the flip side, if you come from a more management background, maybe you're a CFO, maybe you're a COO, or yeah, just work in operations, and then you're jumping into a CISO role, mm. you can kind of feel a bit over your head because yeah, you don't yeah. mind not know the technical side of things. Yeah. Um, and you know, no one really has like the perfect, I suppose mix of the two you obviously can have a mix of the two but knowing both is extremely difficult yeah well being technical and also like kind of having that business sort of mindset because cybersecurity again most CISOs are probably probably have less than maybe eight years experience in the industry total so it becomes a, a bit of a tricky tricky one where those very specialized and professional things that you're going to pick up maybe you know, if you talk to a CFO that's had 20 years, 25 years, they're going to be very well versed in every aspect of their profession. Whereas cybersecurity, because it's so new, you know, not every CISO is going to be perfect. So, you know, some of them may have gaps in some of their knowledge. So it probably also lends a bit on top of the management staff to make sure that they're able to support the CISO as well and have that um, accountability and that relationship where they can talk to the CISO and make sure that you know, everyone's on the same page, everyone's up to date, everyone knows what's up. Yeah, and that comes back to the same problem of, uh, you know, you, you to get that, you kind of need resourcing though. Yeah. To, just because you need to patch your own gaps, say, if if I was in a sizer role and I have great people management skills, but my technical ability is maybe a bit lacking, well, I need to hire someone who can fill that gap for me yep. but if you can't get the funds for that and you can't communicate the funds for that but to, well you're in a you're back at square one yeah yeah exactly thanks for listening just a reminder that the cyber minutes podcast is for educational purposes only the views expressed by hosts and guests are their own not necessarily their employers advice discussed is general advice we promote ethical discussions not illegal activities have a cybersecurity question send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it stay cyber safe